Frontline Scotland believes this man, William Gage, is in jail for a murder he didn't commit. He's been caught up in one of Scotland's most controversial killings, a gangland execution in a suburban street. According to the Crown, this was an open and shut case. But tonight we can reveal how even the trial judge, Lord Emsley, has raised serious concerns over this extraordinary murder case. We can also reveal that the inconsistencies which helped convict William Gage are now under challenge. A challenge which will rock the Scottish legal system to its very foundations. It's 10 o'clock on a Thursday night. 30-year-old Justin McElroy is on his way home to his pregnant wife. They live in an expensive area of Cambus Lang, on the edge of Glasgow's commuter belt. As he arrives home, it's dark, and the street where he lives, Acacia Way, is quiet. But someone is waiting for Justin McElroy. Investigations continue into the murder of a 30-year-old man who was shot last night outside his home in Canvas Lang. The 30-year-old victim, Justin McElroy, was returned... The man was taken to hospital where he died from his injuries. So, a brutal and calculated murder in a peaceful suburban street. A young man left dead, his pregnant wife, now a widow. But almost immediately, this case was shrouded in controversy. That's because the victim... Justin McElroy was no ordinary suburban businessman. The evidence indicates that he was someone who had unsavoury, unpleasant connections. Justin McElroy led a double life. Six days before the murder, Justin had sipped champagne alongside First Minister Jack McConnell at a fundraising dinner. One of the hosts is his father, Thomas McElroy a loyal donor to the Scottish Labour Party and a successful businessman. But beneath the surface, Justin McElroy was in fact a big-time player in the drugs world. For two years, he'd been under surveillance by drugs officers. And four days before his shooting, someone else had him in their sights. A notorious gangland enforcer pays a visit to Justin McElroy. There was a threat which was known to uh, the police authorities, or became known to the, the police in Scotland, um, hanging over his head. Perhaps only Justin McElroy knows the full details of exactly uh, what was going on at that moment. Justin McElroy owed someone £50,000. He's left in no doubt that the debt will not be written off. To find the killer, the police were initially dependent on eyewitness statements. These reconstructions are based on statements given to the police. The first from Justin's wife, Tracy. I was in the kitchen at my home at 29 Nicasia Way, Cambus Lang, with my sister Kelly Curry, who stays with me. At this time, I heard three or four loud bangs from outside the front of my house. <coughs> I looked out the windows at the top of the door. I saw a man at the top of my driveway. He was aged late 20s, early 30s, slim to medium build, 5 foot 10 inches tall. He was wearing a blue or, or green hooded bomber jacket with a hood up and a similar coloured scarf covering his nose and mouth. I leaned out and saw the same person run down the street and out of the view of the house. I cannot identify the man who ran off. Well, generally, the first statement uh, a witness gives is likely to be the most reliable account. Um, one reason for that is that it's at that point the witness has had least exposure to potentially uh, misleading or suggestive information. So, in this case, uh, Tracy McElroy was interviewed um, within an hour of the original event. 
Tracy McElroy's neighbor, Julie War, also gives a statement to police shortly after the shooting. I was lying in bed. At five past 10, I heard the gun go off. I don't know why, I just knew it was a gunshot. As I looked out the window, I saw a man running. By now, he was on the pavement at the front of my house. I would describe this man as male, white, aged 25 to 35 years, 5 foot 10 to 5 foot 11 inches tall, and of medium build. The shoulders of the anorak looked padded with square stitching, a quilted look. This is a police artist's impression of the jacket that Julie saw that night. Five days after the murder of her husband, Tracy McElroy gives her second statement to the police. In it, she remembers more details about the gunman. These will prove to be crucial. I have thought hard about the man's description. An athletic male, 5'11", wearing a thick anorak-type jacket, waist length. It had a pearly sheen off it with an Eskimo snood. Gloves, dark coloured, no jewellery. Dark shoes and a scarf covering nose and mouth, wrapped round his face under the snood. The man passed directly under the lamppost outside my driveway and was well lit. We were talking about a witness who saw someone from about 10 or 12 metres away, uh, who was running away at night um, under a sodium street lamp. Uh, and there's certainly limitations to the details of a face that you could see. As the killer escapes, he's apparently spotted by another witness, Stephen Madden. I saw a figure running down the path onto the pavement. His face was covered by a dark or black ski mask. It had two eye holes and a mouth hole. He was wearing a dark bubble anorak type jacket. By bubble, I mean padded. I again looked in my rear view mirror. I saw the front seat passenger in the white car pull off the ski mask. He had a kind of ball face, maybe a bit of a chubby face, a rounded head. His hair was short. He had a, he had a full head of hair. It was dark black, maybe brown. Stephen Madden's description of the man getting into this car matches those given by both Tracy McElroy and Julie War. But he's the only witness to see the killer without his mask on. One hour after the shooting, the police are convinced they have the getaway car. At 11 o'clock that night, a white Saab 9000 is found abandoned here in Easterhouse, eight miles from Cambus Lang. An unsuccessful attempt has been made to burn the car. Inside is a jacket, a pair of gloves and a snood like a ski mask, a treasure trove of forensics. On the jacket and snood, the police find firearms discharge residue, or FDR, particles which are left after a gun is fired. Also on the jacket, as well as the gloves, the police find DNA. It matches that of a man they know well, a man with previous convictions, a man called William Gage. The police now have a white Saab which was owned at some point by second-hand car dealer William Gage. They have his DNA which was on some of the clothes found inside as well as some firearms particles. All they have to do now is link the car with the murder. Just after 10 I heard a car's wheel spinning. I looked out and I saw a white car. I saw the car was a Volvo, white colour and a white spoiler on the back. The type was a Volvo 440. Charles Bowman was a security guard on a building site next to Acacia Way. The car he sees that night is white, like the car found at Easter House, but he insists it's a Volvo 440 and not a Saab 9000. Despite Charles Bowman's statement, the Crown is adamant the white car he sees leaving Cambus Lang is the same white car abandoned in Easter House. On the 3rd of May 2002, William Gage is charged with the murder of Justin McElroy. On the face of it, the police and the Crown had a watertight case. The DNA, the firearms particles, the white Saab, 
all point to William Gage being the killer of Justin McElroy. But we believe that if you look harder at the case, as we've done, things aren't quite as clear-cut as they seem. Firstly, does the mysterious car found in Easter House have anything to do with the murder at all? All the witnesses who see the getaway car insist that it's white. But just one day after Charles Bowman gives his statement in which he's adamant that it's a Volvo 440, something happens to change his mind. I was taken to Paisley Police Office where I was shown a white car that I noticed was a white Saab. On looking at the white Saab, I can say that it's similar to the car I said was a Volvo, although I can't state if it is that car. That's you know, a good example of the suggestion coming from the investigating officers. I think really what you can, can, can conclude from that witness is that um, they saw a white car and they don't really know what make it was. But one detail which all the witnesses do seem to agree on is the type of jacket worn by the gunman. A thick anorak type jacket. The shoulders of the anorak look padded with square stitching, a quilted look. Dark bubble anorak type jacket, by bubble I mean padded. Several witnesses who undoubtedly saw the gunman leaving the scene describe this uh, padded jacket that he was wearing. So I think we can be fairly confident um, in that description. But the jacket found in the Saab with William Gage's DNA on it is a thin cagoule and not a padded jacket as described by all the witnesses. Despite this obvious discrepancy, the cagoule becomes critical to the Crown's case. When the police examine it, six particles of firearms discharge residue are found. The particular residue we're talking about comes from a part of the firearms cartridge which is known as the primer. This is the first part of the cartridge to explode when a gun is fired. This primer, when it is fired, turns into thousands and thousands of minute particles. But only six particles are found on the jacket in the Saab, three on the surface and three in the pocket, and none inside the Saab itself. The particle type is so common as to be untraceable, yet this constitutes the forensic evidence against William Gage. A report compiled by Strathclyde Police states the existence of these particles prove that the wearer of this jacket has recently fired a gun or has handled recently discharged ammunition, but we discovered this isn't true. The report in some respects is biased in that it offered no uh, alternative sources for these particles. They could have been present on the clothing because the clothing had come into contact with some other article of clothing or some other surface on which the particles were present. But no distinction of this sort is made by the report. Given that the jacket had been exposed to six shots or been worn in the presence of six shots, then I would have expected rather more particles to be present on the surface of the jacket. Dr Lloyd is not convinced the jacket's been worn by someone who's just fired a gun. It's not very good evidence, really. Not very good evidence at all. A few months after Justin McElroy's murder, Strathclyde police organise an identity parade. But it's abandoned after William Gage complains none of the parade volunteers resemble him at all. But the day doesn't prove to be a total waste of time for the police. Tracy McElroy is shown a mannequin, dressed in the clothes found in the Saab. I was taken into a room and shown clothing which was on a model. I recognised the clothing as being the same as the description that I had given the police of the man I'd seen running outside my house on the day my husband was murdered. But the clothes are not the same as the ones described in Tracy McElroy's original statements or the police artist's impression. Now the padded jacket has become a thin cagoule. It's quite a bizarre procedure, which I've uh, not encountered um, in any other case that I've uh, consulted on. Um, I'm not really clear 
what the police were were trying to achieve. I mean, obviously, it's, it's going to be a disturbing and upsetting event for the witness. Um, it's probably going to provoke recall of the original event, um, and then.